it's great to, um, well, not see you. Uh, it's great to be talking with you. Um, I wish I was there in real life so I could uh, see some of the beautiful birds um, out in Point Reyes. Um, but I'm talking to you from uh, my house here near Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started talking about shade grown coffee. Uh, hopefully, many of you have already heard of shade grown coffee. Um, it's, it's uh, tastes good and it's good for bird conservation. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get right into it. So I don't, I tend to tell a lot of stories and talk, talk, talk. So I'm going to try to uh, not, not go off on too many tangents. Um, so first, just a little bit, little bit about me. Um, this is me in the picture, obviously, and you might recognize that little blue bird as a cerulean warbler, um, which you occasionally get in California, um, but we have a lot of them here in West Virginia. And that's my friend uh, Bill Hilton, um, who's a bird bander, and he had uh, caught this little bird in a mist net at the New River Birding and Nature Festival uh, near Fayetteville, West Virginia. And we thought it was a good time to um, introduce the bird to his likeness on the cover of my book about cerulean warblers. Um, as Morgan mentioned, I'm the president of my local um, Audubon Society. And I've also um, co-founded an organization called the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. As a long name, we usually just say ACCA. Uh, we rehabilitate uh, all species of native birds and try to get them back to the wild and we do some education with non-releasable birds. Uh, I'm also a voice uh, for the birds and beans coffee and we'll talk more about that in a little uh, in a few minutes. Um, but I first got interested in shade grown coffee when I was researching the book about cerulean warblers. Uh, I got interested in cerulean warblers because they are uh, we have a lot of them around here in Morgantown, West Virginia, where I live. West Virginia has about 36% of the world's breeding population of cerulean warblers. Um, and here, their population uh, is declining uh, in part due to habitat loss. And here in the breeding range, that habitat loss is uh, giant strip mining, mountaintop removal, coal mining. But then I learned that they're also losing habitat in their uh, along their migratory corridor and where they spend the winter. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So um, you may have, you've probably heard about the, the famous uh, report that came out last year in science that we have lost 3 billion of our birds um, since 1970, which is truly uh, shocking and very sad. Uh, Neotropical migrant songbirds, like the cerulean warbler right here, um, and a lot of other species that bird watchers uh, like us enjoy seeing when they get back from migration. Uh, they spend the breeding season in North America and they spend the winters in Central or South America. And they're in um, steep decline, many of them. Um, as a group, warbler numbers dropped by 617 million individual birds um, since 1970, which is truly shocking. Uh, that we have so many fewer than we used to. Cerulean warbler and golden winged warbler are uh, the two species that are probably declining uh, faster than any other neotropical migrant. Um, they have declined by 70 to 80 percent since 1970, which is horrible. Um, Wilson's warbler, which is a species that, that we have here and uh, you have out there also, have declined by you know about 60 percent. Um, McGillivray's warbler, which we don't have here in West Virginia, unfortunately, but you are lucky to have out in California. Um, their population has dropped by about 50 percent since uh, 1970 also, um, according to uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So those are um, shocking numbers, and those are all species of birds that can we can help by drinking uh, the right kind of coffee. But before we even get to the coffee itself, um, sometimes I think of birds in my region, you know, birds that nest in my region as my birds. Um, and this is a little uh, bluebird, not a bird that migrates uh, to Central or South America, although they do migrate down into Mexico. Um, but we have them here all year in West Virginia, the Eastern Bluebird. This is right outside my door here. 
um, hopefully they've got eggs in there right now. Uh, but I think often if a bird nests in my region, it's mine. But of course, they're not just mine. Um, neotropical migrants are someone else's birds also, uh, a lot of other people's birds. Um, and it's important that we think about birds, not just where they breed, but about where they live throughout the year. Um, you know, if I think, gosh, I really want to have cerulean warblers in my yard, I'm going to try to um, create the kind of habitat that might attract them here. You know, that's great, but that's only one small part of their life cycle. They really spend the majority of their life cycle in the tropics. So thinking about how we can help conserve birds in those areas is, is very important. Um, not just thinking about where they breed, which is how my brain usually goes to, where are they nesting? They're mine. So this little guy, this is just from uh, Cornell. I just took a screenshot. I know that you've all, you've all probably seen Wilson's Warbler, um, adorable little, little fellow. And if you haven't had a chance to look at uh, these range maps that Cornell has put out, this is where the birds move throughout the year. So this is Wilson's Warbler and you can see them just uh, all leaving the tropics um, and, and heading throughout North America and then all coming back down um, into uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, another bird that, that we meant, I mentioned earlier, um, that Gillivray's warbler, which looks a lot like a morning warbler to me. Um, another species that's in decline that you have out in California. So watch this range map because it'll happen quickly. You can see this bird um, in Mexico and into Central America um, in the winter. And then um, as the year goes on and spring migration hits, there they go, up, up to California and um, on up into Canada. And then there they all go, <laughs> um, back down, uh, back down to uh, the Mexico and Central America. So what's really amazing about those two species, you see how they spread um, throughout a lot of North America, but then where they spend the, the winter, it's in this very, very 90, not narrow, tiny band. Western wood peewee, um, we have the eastern wood peewee here, of course, which you've got this adorable little flycatcher, the western wood peewee, and this is a bird that goes farther than Wilson's warbler um, or McGillivray's warbler, so the western wood peewee there he is in the, in the winter, you can see where they're spending the winter down in, uh, down in the Northern Andes of South America. Um, I'll turn this on and you'll see when spring hits, there they go, all the way up through the West and then there they go again, all the way back down into South America, through Central America. So you get a, a even these birds that are going all the way to South America are getting there often by going through Central America. So that very narrow band of habitat is really important for them. And the Western wood peewee um, can be found on um, coffee farms in Colombia and Wilson's and McGillivray's warblers can both be found on coffee farms in Nicaragua. And we'll get to that coffee farm stuff in a minute, but I wanna show you my favorite bird besides the turkey vulture, um, the cerulean warbler. You'll notice the abundance of this bird looks different. They're not as abundant as uh, the last three species we looked at, but there they are um, in the northern Andes of uh, Colombia, Venezuela, um, Ecuador, and they're a little bit uh, in Peru also. Um, but watch what happens when these guys start moving. It's like they're, they're only in Central America very, very briefly as they make their way back to South America. Um, and their range is, uh, in, the breeding, in the breeding season, their range is pretty small. Um, we have about 36% in West Virginia and about 80% in Central Appalachia. So, um, habitat loss uh, in the non-breeding range for um, a lot of these species is a development for agriculture, deforestation. Um, coffee production is one of the big ones. Um, clearing land for um, cattle farming, and for other kinds of agriculture, um, like um, cacao, which is a, a, the fruit where coffee, coffee comes from, um, can also, that's also a problem for birds or just development and deforestation in general. But coffee production uh, is a big one. 
Um, and you can see this, this picture I have here on the left. I was very fortunate to get to go to Columbia uh, several years ago. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Columbia, um, it has more bird species than uh, any country on the planet right now. I think there are a few countries that kind of battle it out for who has the most species, but Columbia right now is winning. Um, I think they have something like 17, 1800 uh, bird species. And the uh, place I visited is in the coffee region um, in northeastern Colombia, um, not far from uh, Bucaramanga. Uh, this particular picture shows um, a hillside that's been cleared of most of the trees to grow coffee. Um, the coffee shrubs in this picture are still pretty small. Um, but in areas uh, where coffee is produced, this is, this is usually what it looks like. They have trees and the vegetation will be mostly cut down and coffee shrubs um, will be growing in the sun. If you look at this map of, this is from NOAA, of where um, coffee is grown, you can see it is in the same band uh, where 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south latitude, where our neotropical migrant songbirds spend the winter. Um, and there are other songbirds that, of course, spend the winter in the other in um, Africa and eight other parts of Asia, but um, we're just going to focus on the ones in our hemisphere. Um, so coming back to deforestation. So the coffee, coffee originated in Africa, um, in Ethiopia. Um, it was, it evolved there and then it, uh, people began farming it. Um, the traditional way that you grew coffee um, was in the shade of the forest canopy. Um, so you could leave the, leave the forest and grow the coffee in the shade and coffee is a shrub. You can see it in this picture. Um, those are coffee shrubs, those shrubby things, kind of the first layer of vegetation is coffee. And then um, as coffee uh, was cultivated and grown in other parts of the world, they kept using traditional methods to grow the coffee. They continued to leave the shade trees and grow the coffee um, underneath the forest canopy. But coffee shrubs grow more quickly in the sun. Um, a lot of plants, of course, grow more quickly in the sun. Uh, due to pressure to produce more coffee more quickly, uh, forests are cleared. Um, and as uh, this, is this is really escalated um, since the you know, 1970s, 1980s, more forests have been cleared for uh, coffee production. Um, and unfortunately, that was also the time that really large scale sh um, strip mining started happening in Appalachia. So I've always got cerulean warblers on the brain. Um, so they're losing habitat you know, throughout their range from that time um, on. So uh, shade grown coffee is a way to com combat this deforestation. So, but what is shade grown coffee? Um, just like the name sounds, it's coffee that's grown in the shade using the traditional, traditional methods. Um, it preserves or restores native forests. The picture of the shade uh, of the coffee farm on the left is one in Colombia that uh, it's a forest that's being restored. So it's not, it's this forest was cut down and they're restoring the forest by trying to grow the trees back um, and growing the coffee shrubs um, beneath them. You also might notice there are, there's kind of a mid layer of uh, banana trees. Um, often farmers who grow a coffee shrub can grow um, another, another produce above it, coffee or um, vanilla or bananas, um, plantains, vanilla, uh, that can be a great other source of income for the family. Um, but banana trees um, don't provide the same kind of habitat for you know, our uh, neotropical migrants um, that these big broadleaf um, evergreen trees do. Uh, but anyway, shade grown coffee. So it preserves or restores the native, native forests. But it's important to point out that while shade grown coffee farms are great for birds because um, you know, they provide uh, habitat for them, they are not as good as primary forests. So primary forests in the tropics will still have more, more species um, than a shade grown coffee farm. But uh, the neotropical migrants um, like, kind of tend to like the disturbed habitat uh, of a shade-grown coffee farm. So 
in addition to providing um, habitat for these songbirds that spend the winters in the tropics, shade-grown coffee um, can help uh, sequester carbon. The trees sequester carbon, which helps with climate change, of course. Uh, helps with erosion. The soil is healthier um, because of the different kinds of plant species. You don't have this monoculture. You have a variety of species keeping the soil healthy. Um, it reduces the need for pesticides and fertilizers also. You've got nature's pesticides, you know, the birds living above the coffee that will actually eat some of the insects that attack coffee. So it helps keep the farmers safe in addition to um, you know, in addition to having habitat for the songbirds, it helps keep the farmers safe by reducing their need to use um, chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Uh, coffee beans also, um, we can't forget about taste because that's important to coffee drinkers. Um, the beans mature more slowly in the shade, uh, which results um, in coffee with a richer flavor. Um, if you've tasted shade-grown coffee and then you go back and taste coffee that's grown in the full sun, um, I, can, I can definitely tell the difference. It's a lot richer if it's grown in the shade. Of course, um, since it takes longer uh, to grow in the shade, shade-grown coffee is often a little bit more expensive than coffee grown in the full sun. Um, when I went to uh, Colombia, I listened to a presentation um, at the coffee, Colombian Coffee Federation um, headquarters where they said, um, you know, we don't want to be known as the destroyers of birds, but we have to be able to turn a profit. You know, we have to be able to feed our families. Um, so you have to give us this market for shade grown coffee or, you know, we can't do it. So um, it does, it is a, a little bit more expensive than coffee in the full sun. So the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center uh, has the Bird Friendly certification, which is usually considered the gold standard for coffee certifications. Um, and this, this map over here on the left shows uh, where, um, where bird friendly certified coffee um, comes from. So these little red points on here are, all, are showing you farms that are certified bird friendly by the Smithsonian Migratory Gert, Gert, that Bird Center. What? Um, bird friendly coffee is 100% shade grown. There are other certifications out there uh, that are not 100% shade grown coffee. Um, the coffee might have a 30% um, shade grown, you know, or 50% shade grown but Bird Friendly is 100% shade grown coffee. Um, it's also USDA organic. Um, the Bird Friendly uh, certification too, if you're a, a person who's interested in um, tree species in the tropics, um, you can go on the uh, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center's website, which is um, drinkbirdfriendly.com, and they can give you a lot more information about the tree species. It's, they have a very specific criteria for their shade coffee farms. If they're going to certify it bird friendly, the criteria has the criteria has to be met, and they have independent people come in and certify farms. Um, so you you know if you're drinking bird friendly coffee, it's the uh, it's helping protect birds by providing them habitat. Um, oh, there's the bird friendly logo. I almost forgot I included that. So this is the logo has changed a little bit over the years. Um, early, the early 2000s is when this really got started. Um, the logo has evolved and this is the current, this is the current logo. So if you see this bird friendly Smithsonian um, logo on your coffee bag, um, you know you're getting coffee that's 100% grown in the shade. Um, this is a, a graphic from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center that I think does a really good job of uh, showing how coffee grown in the full sun um, only has a few uh, six, well, 61 bird species, it's not really a few, it's a lot. Um, this data is from a coffee farm in Peru. And then the partial shade, um, where you might have banana trees, uh, other fruit trees, some citrus, um, that partial shade provides some habitat for birds. But when you get into this kind of rustic, uh, bird-friendly shade, um, you might have as many as 243 bird species, which is what one of their farms in Peru um, has. Uh, which is really incredible. Um, it's also kind of amazing to think about, you know, our birds um, sharing, you know, sharing a couple trees in a coffee farm 
uh, with these you know, amazing tropical birds. Columbia has uh, more than 100 species of hummingbird. Um, there are you know, toucanets and uh, parakeets and uh, all, a lot of tanagers um, you know, hanging out there with our you know, Canada warblers and um, cerulean warblers, uh, western wood peewees. Um, barn swallows. So uh, it's amazing all these birds together and then all dispersing into North America. But not all shade-grown coffee is equal. So there are some, some um, coffee might call itself shade-grown uh, and the shade is provided by, you know, banana trees. But if it's bird-friendly, um, that lets you know that it's uh, grown underneath trees that provide suitable habitat for our um, neotropical migrants. So I looked up, since you all are out there in California, which I have not done too much birding. I did, I did go, I've been to the Salton Sea birding before, which was really pretty cool, um, but I haven't been in several years. But I, I went through the list of uh, songbirds that you might get out in California, and I kind of cross-checked them with my list of birds that use farms in Nicaragua and Colombia. Nicaragua is a very important country for a lot of our neotropical migrants. Um, and it's a really important uh, coffee producing country also. So these species that are probably familiar to you, Western wood peewee, olive-sided flycatcher, yellow-bellied flycatcher, um, Swainson's thrush um, is one of my favorite birds. Um, we talked about the uh, Megilla Vray's warbler, yellow warbler, another bird that we have in the east also, uh, Wilson's warbler, Western tanager, and I think you occasionally get summer tanagers out there. Um, those are all California birds um, that that use shade grown coffee farms. And I wanna talk about the Swainson's thrush for one minute because like I said, it's one of my favorite birds. Um, they're gonna be, they're kind of a late migrant. They're not back here in West Virginia yet, but they go deeper into South America than a lot of the other birds do. If you, if you look at this map, I'm gonna, I'll make it move in a second, but if you look at how far they're kind of even down into the Southern cone a little bit of South America, which is um, farther than a lot of our birds go. Uh, and then where do you see how, I mean, you probably know how far north they go, but it's just, it's amazing to me. There they go. And there they go, and all the way up into Canada and Alaska. And then there they go, I'll go again. Um, it's almost, uh, it's, it's almost like they're in, they're in constant motion. Um, and uh, kind of a side note, this little Swainson's thrush is a bird that I had at my um, rehab center um, last year. And unfortunately, this bird um, hit a window in West Virginia um, during migration, um, which is another window strikes are of course um, trouble for uh, birds of all kind. Um, but this Swainson's thrush um, hit a window and unfortunately was not able to be released back to the wild. Um, he wasn't going to be able to make that tremendous flight from West Virginia to, you know, deep into South America. Um, but he has a permanent home at the Columbus Zoo in Ohio. So if any of you visit the Columbus Zoo and go through their walkthrough aviary, you might see this very Swainson's thrush. <laughs> um, so I mentioned the cerulean warbler, uh, one of my favorite birds who uses coffee farms um, a lot. Um, a couple other birds in, in the east, eastern birds that would use shade-grown coffee farms, um, the chestnut-sided warbler, uh, who I don't think ever quite ventures out where you are, but it's a beautiful little bird that uh, occasionally makes it into South America, but spends a lot of time on the shade grown coffee farms in Nicaragua. Um, the yellow warbler we just we just talked about, uh, they're throughout much of North America and they're also um, a coffee bird. They, they spend the winters in those coffee farms in Central America. Um, Baltimore Oriole is another species that spends the winter on the coffee farms in Central America also. Um, and they should be getting back here in West Virginia um, any time now. So, um, I don't know if you can see those kids if there are boxes in front of them or not, but uh, when I went to um, Columbia, I was there with a group of folks um, actually at a Cerulean Warbler, a Golden Wing Warbler Summit. And these, uh, there was a migratory bird festival um, in the town that we visited, San Vicente de Chucuri, and the kids of the town um, dressed up as cerulean warblers and golden wing warblers. Um, it had a parade that was amazing. My, my face hurt from smiling um, so much. And other kids um, made cerulean warblers and painted them and wore them on their visors. Uh, and then these um, boys over here in this picture 
um, we went on a bird walk in the, in the city park and they were pointing out species to us. There are about 20 of us in our group. Um, they just had just showed me a banana clip. So shade grown coffee, um, not only, uh, it's not only good for birds, but it can be really good for these, these communities also. Um, a lot of the shade grown coffee, bird friendly coffee comes from co-ops, uh, small family farms that um, are allowed to uh, continue with their on their small farms instead of having to convert these giant uh, giant swashes of land to sun coffee. So small family farms um, can be protected uh, by drinking bird friendly coffee also. And birds have this really amazing ability to connect people, you know, across continents, uh, languages, cultures, you know, socioeconomic status. I mean, birds are. Uh, they're kind of the uniter of all these folks um, here, you know, in, in West Virginia and California and Nicaragua and Colombia and the places in between. Um, these migratory songbirds really connect us. Um, and they do a service for us everywhere where they go. And as bird people, um, you probably already know a lot of the services that they, they provide. Um, they, you know, they pollinate, they disperse seeds, um, they eat insects and other animals we consider pests. On coffee farms, um, having raptors on your coffee farm um, is good also. They eat rodents um, that could otherwise damage some of the crops. And uh, our um, broad-winged hawks that we have um, here in the eastern U.S. and central U.S. Um, will overwinter in coffee farms also. Um, American kestrels will as well, um, in addition to uh, tropical species like roadside hawks. Um, birds on coffee farms can also help scavenge uh, black vultures, turkey vultures, you know, that, that you have plenty of turkey vultures in California and we do here also. And some of our turkey vultures migrate to the tropics uh, and are seen, you know, local turkey vultures and migrant turkey vultures um, over coffee farms in Central and South America. Some of our turkey vultures go out, make it all the way to Colombia and Venezuela also. So all of us are united by these birds that do these ecosystem services for us. And by providing, uh, by purchasing and drinking only shade grown coffee, you're also um, helping fight climate change um, and deforestation and a lot of these uh, big issues that are sometimes tough to, uh, tough to get your head around how to help them. Shade grown coffee is another, uh, another great thing about it is that it's a consumer choice we can make to save birds and we don't have to uh, you know, write to political um, officials, elected officials. Um, we don't have to uh, do anything really other than just buy the shade grown coffee and drink it. Uh, it's a very easy consumer choice. But when I've given um, talks about shade grown coffee and about cerulean warblers in particular, I've been surprised that people um, people don't don't know about shade grown coffee. It's been one of the biggest surprises of of giving these talks is that. Uh, a lot of people don't don't know about the bird friendly coffee, um, and uh, this is my sort of small plug for birds and beans. Um, birds and beans uh, is a uh, they, they the coffee is roasted in uh, New England, uh, but they get their coffee from farms in uh, Nicaragua, uh, Peru, um, Guatemala, um, Honduras, and sometimes sometimes Mexico. And all of their coffee is triple certified as bird friendly, um, USDA organic, um, and fair trade. Um, there are other other some organizations um, also have shade grown coffee. The American Birding Association offers a line of shade grown coffee, um, and there are others also. But you want to um, look for that bird friendly Smithsonian logo um, on the coffee that you get. Um, here in West Virginia, I usually have to order it um, online. Uh, but the great thing about birds and beans, or one of the great things, is that they have, they will partner with nonprofit organizations and they will um, allow nonprofits to purchase the coffee at uh, wholesale costs that then you can sell it and kind of keep the difference as a fundraiser. So my small um, avian conservation center of Appalachia um, is a conservation partner with birds and beans coffee. So um, we're able to uh, sell this coffee as a fundraiser. And uh, we, I drink a lot of the wood thrush, um, the medium roast, which is the one I, I, I showed here. So um, 
I think that I talked, I feel like I've talked very, very quickly, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you might have about this. This picture here is uh, Colombia, again, Northeastern Colombia, and it probably looks not unlike some parts of California um, and West Virginia. So if anybody has any, oh, actually, I think that I can figure out, there we go. I think I can figure out how to do this. Um, okay, yeah, why are no coffee farms in Costa Rica producing bird-friendly coffee? That is an excellent question. So there are coffee farms um, in Costa Rica that do produce uh, coffee and the farms are um, healthy and have, and have uh, um, a lot of shade trees, a lot of canopy trees. Um, I've got a, a friend whose family um, owns a coffee farm in Costa Rica and they get cerulean warblers going through on migration. Um, and a lot of folks from the US, from North America, do um, visit Costa Rica and see coffee um, being grown in uh, coffee farms that, um, that you know, are ecosystems, not just sun coffee. Um, but to my knowledge so far, um, none of the, none of the coffee farms just um, haven't met the bird friendly criteria in Costa Rica. Uh, it probably has to do with um, the types of trees or the age of the trees over that are shading the coffee. Sometimes if you are trying to restore a forest, you know, growing trees can take a long time. Uh, the coffee farm pictures, many of the farm pictures I showed you from Colombia, that coffee is not certified yet because the trees have not matured enough. Um, there's not quite the different uh, variety of species that the Smithsonian uh, Migratory Bird Center um, will certify. So uh, there are, again, good, good coffee coffee farms um, in Costa Rica, but they're just, they're not quite certified as Smithsonian bird friendly yet. Um, but hopefully they will be um, more and more, as more and more um, coffee farms come on, hopefully they will be soon. Uh, that was a good question though. That was, that's one of, that's one of my questions often also is, you know, um, you know, why, uh, you know, why are there not uh, more, you know, farms in Costa Rica producing bird friendly, but I think they're, I think they're getting there. Oh, and I love the warbler range map. Thank you, me too. Those range maps are, um, are amazing. Um, and I just discovered them recently, uh, the on, um, Birds of the World, um, which is uh, an amazing um, online service you can subscribe to. Um, and it's, uh, it's really neat. You can see those maps for all, like every species is amazing. Um, okay, oh, here's a question. We often look for, we often look for organic coffee. Does organically grown coffee provide any benefits for birds or does one really need to buy shade grown coffee? So um, organic coffee certainly provides benefits for birds. Um, it's pretty difficult. Uh, it's pretty difficult to get um, the organic, the USDA organic certification. It can be expensive for a lot of these small farms. Um, so it does provide you know, you're not using the pet, you're not, the soil is healthy, you're not using, you know, certain pesticides or fertilizers. However, um, my understanding is that organic doesn't necessarily mean that there are trees above it or that there are the kind of trees that our, you know, migratory songbirds can use. Um, but the bird friendly coffee is also organic. So when you get the, the Smithsonian bird friendly, you're also getting organic coffee. So I would say organic coffee is certainly um, better than non-organic coffee, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have the tree species diversity required by the Smithsonian. Um, there are other certifications though that, that uh, the coffee is not organic or um, shade grown. Uh, but you know, again, a percent might be like 30% or 20%, and they might still put um, a certification on there. And one could, you could certainly argue that coffee with some certification is better than coffee with no certification at all. Um, but it's, um, the bird friendly is really the kind of, again, the gold standard. Okay, wait, things just moved around. Um, 
Katie, um, what about cleaning up? I just I was just cleaning up your Q and A so you could see it more clearly. Okay. Okay. Oh, he startled me. I was like, wow, someone else is there. <laughs> it's sort of weird just talking in your in your kitchen to yourself, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, what about the cerulean warbler makes them among your favorite birds? Uh, well, that's a good, great question. Um, sort of one sort of selfish answer, not really selfish, is that here in West Virginia we have a lot of them. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's, West Virginia is not a state that you usually hear, you know, awesome things about um, or amazing things, but we have more breeding cerulean warblers than any other state. Uh, we also have more breeding wood thrush than any other state. And I believe that we are second uh, number of breeding scarlet tanagers. We have a lot of forests um, in West Virginia. We're one of the top, maybe second or third, third or fourth forested state. And cerulean warblers are an interior forest songbird. They do like some gaps in the canopy, but they like a hardwood, mature to old growth, hardwood forest on ridges. Um, and that's kind of my preferred habitat also. Um, they're also a very beautiful little bird, very difficult to see. They have that very sad story of being um, the fastest declining uh, songbird in North America. So it's a I think all those reasons uh, make them uh, one of my favorite species. Uh, they're also so high up in the canopy and so difficult to see. If you've ever been birding and trying to see a cerulean warbler, I mean, you'll have you know, you know you'll have a very sore neck afterwards um, because they are so high up in the canopy. So kind of seeing one is like really an achievement. <laughs> like I saw the cerulean, you know, and it's it's even more difficult to photograph way up there. Um, uh, does it cost, this, here's a question, um, does it cost a farm money to become certified bird friendly? Maybe some of the Costa Rica farms just don't want to go through the process. Um, that's an excellent question also, and I, I think it is um, a little bit uh, difficult. I have, looking over here, I have my other computer up, um, and that might actually be uh, a, a, one of the questions that they, that Smithsonian um, answers on their website. It's I know that getting the getting um, USDA organic certification can be expensive, and it does take several years. So one of the hurdles to uh, I know to farms some farms in Nicaragua some of the one of the hurdles uh, I think it's three years that you have to wait as you're trying to get your farm to be certified organic, and during that time. Uh, you can't sell your coffee as with that certification on it. So uh, it can be a weird time for farms when you're trying to get certification, but you can't, there's, at least to my knowledge, there's not like an intermediate certification, like this coffee is from a farm that's trying. You know, I don't think that there's that kind of certification yet. Um, so I'm trying to see if this says anything about how expensive it costs. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what the cost is to farms, but it's certainly, uh, I would imagine that it, it certainly is a hurdle for some, for some farms. Um, I should mention that one of the ways that farms, that shade farms can make up the money um, in addition to uh, selling the coffee itself, there are farms in, in Nicaragua I know of and in, in Colombia also and they're certainly in other, other countries. A lot of the shade grown farms will um, have uh, cabins that tourists can rent um, where they'll let you kind of come and uh, they'll do presentations about picking the coffee and show you how it's done. So it's sort of um, ecotourism possibilities for visiting these farms um, are, are important to a lot of the farms also. Um, yeah, I'm not finding exactly how much it costs on here, so, but I know that it, no, it does. And the list of the list of farms uh, on Smithsonian's website is a list of the specific farms um, where their coffee comes from. And a lot of them have Facebook pages or Instagram pages, so you can go and look at these pictures and of these farms, you know, on Facebook and see where your coffee comes from, which uh, which I do a lot. It's kind of amazing. Okay, does anyone else have any questions about anything? And fair trade, I should mention something too, that 
a lot of these farms are also fair trade, the bird friendly farms, um, USDA organic fair trade um, and bird friendly. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to my talk. Is there any more? Hey, Katie, it's Morgan. I have a question. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, I was curious, how did you get involved or inspired to um, learn so much about Shade Grown Coffee and come out and do these presentations to share with the public? Ah, so, well, when I first, um, you know, heard about the cerulean warbler uh, when I started doing research into ceruleans. Um, I mean, I'm a writer, not, you know, officially a biologist. Uh, I just am a birder who's kind of obsessed with, obsessed with birds. Um, so, so I, uh, uh, oh, uh-oh, oh no, my, I didn't mean for that to go away, sorry. Let me put that pretty picture back up on the screen of Columbia. Um, there we go. Um, I wrote my book about the cerulean warbler with only the breeding season. So I went to Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and I wrote my book about the cerulean and the problems it faces in the breeding season. And then I showed it to my, um, my literary agent. Um, and I said, you know, I'd heard about this cerulean warbler summit going on in Columbia. It's too bad my book is already finished, you know, and, and he said, um, your book is not finished. You have to go to Columbia. Um, and I thought that sounded sort of scary um, at the time. Uh, but I went um, and it was completely amazing. The whole, the whole thing was amazing. Um, I loved the birds. I really would love to go back um, and uh, do more birding in more parts of Columbia. So after I wrote the book um, about cerulean warblers, birds and beans coffee um, contacted me and said, you know, we love what you said in the book about shade grown coffee. Um, you know, have you had our coffee? Do you know about our coffee? Um, we would love uh, for you to, um, you know, put a quote from your book on our website. Um, and I said, sure, that would be great. And then, you know, I got our nonprofit hooked up with them to do um, as a conservation partner. And um, Birds and Beans, um, I will sometimes will go out and, and do uh, do talks for Birds and Beans about coffee. And I've gotten, I've, I've, uh, written um, the two children's books that you mentioned in, the, in my introduction. Uh, the co-author of both of those books is actually Bill Wilson, um, who's the owner of Bird, one of the owners of Birds and Beans Coffee. Um, he's a, a great guy. And um, we traveled to, the illustrator and I traveled to organic farm, an organic farm in North Carolina to get ideas for that book. And um, one of our kids' books, I mean, and I've also traveled to a dairy farm in Minnesota um, to talk about the connections between organic farms in North America and organic farms in the tropics. So it's been, um, it's been a lot of fun. I hope that answers your question, Morgan. <laughs> yes, that's Thank you. I, th I think I might have more, wait a second, I may have more questions up here. Oh yes, looks like I need to visit Colombia and Nicaragua. I agree, yes. Um, and I would, I would love to visit um, Nicaragua. I haven't been there yet. I tried to convince um, the folks from Birds and Beans that they needed to send me. So if any of them are watching, um, I would love to go to Nicaragua sometime and visit these farms. Um, here's a question, is shade grown coffee easily available in cafes? So I have um, not ever found shade grown coffee, um, at least in the cafes that I go to in West Virginia, um, Pennsylvania and Virginia where I've lived. Um, it's not easily available. Um, I've seen fair trade coffee um, and organic coffee in cafes, um, but I haven't found shade grown coffee. Um, I would love to. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have not. I have not found it. I know that there's a Birds and Beans um, Canada, kind of a the, the Canada version of Birds and Beans has their own cafe where they, of course, serve only shade grown coffee. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's easily available, but if you own a cafe or go to one a lot, you can tell them about it. Um, I think that oftentimes uh, people don't, just don't know that shade grown coffee is a thing um, and that it's an easy way to help conserve birds and it tastes better. Um, okay, so what else, what else is on here? Yes, um, visit Columbia, Nicaragua. Uh, may we share this presentation with our birding group? Um, that's, that's fine with me. I think that would be great. 
um, tell them to get, uh, tell your group to get bird friendly coffee. Um, I don't know where, um, uh, if this, if shade grown coffee is available, like in your grocery stores um, and stuff like that in, in California, but uh, here it's not really, um, which is kind of a bummer. So um, I wish, I wish that it was more, more widely available because uh, I think that there would be, a, I think there would be a market, but Oh, here's a curveball. What's this? <laughs> um, uh, I apologize for throwing you a curveball. Is there anything positive happening in West Virginia now um, regarding uh, strip mining and reducing coal mining? Oh, so, well, it's kind of, um, I guess, yes, uh, sort of. Um, it's kind of a weird yes, though. Uh, so strip mining and coal mining in general is kind of slowed down, at least it's my understanding, um, has slowed down uh, because of natural gas <laughs> extraction, which causes um, problems for, for birds in some different ways. Um, we have had a real natural gas, um, you may have heard of fracking, uh, we've had a huge sort of fracking boom here in um, West, this part of West, West Virginia um, and some parts of Pennsylvania and uh, Ohio. And um, fracking is also, um, again, not good for birds, uh, but, but it's different. It's a little bit different. It still fragments the forest, but a lot of uh, issues with water pollution come up with fracking. And of course, those same issues of pol water pollution come up with strip mining. I guess that's a long answer to say that the, the mining has, uh, coal is down a little bit in West Virginia in the last, uh, it's been steadily down, um, but that might be due to market factors as there's more of a, there's an abundance of natural gas and people would rather burn natural gas than coal. Um, it's a little bit cleaner in quotation marks. So, uh, so that's the answer to that question. Oh, and thank and someone wrote about turkey vultures. So um, um, you've inspired me to appreciate turkey vultures. That's wonderful. Um, and I hope that the, yes, the kindergartners, kids love turkey vultures, right? Um, I've, they don't have, they haven't learned yet that they're disgusting, you know, so um, thank you. And what else? Uh, oh, fair. Fair trade organically grown is not enough. Yeah, I need to find um, a roaster um, that has it. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I mean, fair trade organically grown is, it's, it's better than not those things, but the bird friendly, though, is really, is better. Uh, it's, it's, it's a guarantee that what you're getting is bird friendly. It's good for birds. Ah, some Safeway stores in California, um, sell Thanksgiving coffee. Yeah, which has a bird friendly Smithsonian certified line. Yes, yes they do. Yep. Well, that's great. Oh, and um, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you both for both of, um, who asked questions. Uh, a lot of people have never associated um, coffee and birds. Uh, I never did until I started researching um, the Cerulean Warbler for that book, but it's, it's shocking when you Think about those range maps and all the, you know, species that might be, um, you know, have a huge North American range. And then they're in this tiny little strip of Central America for the winter. I mean, the, the number and the density of birds, uh, you know, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, you know, the Central America um, in, the, in the winter is just amazing. Um, Gold Country Coffee in Murphy's, California, bird, bird friendly certified. Oh, excellent. That's great. Yeah, well, buy that bird friendly. It's um, it's 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 a very, you know, uh, easy. It's not easy is not the way to say it, but it's a very um, it's a thing you can just go out and do without, without having to um. You know, really be political, I guess. So thank you very much for everybody who was um who was listening and watching. This is a lot of fun makes me want to go to the tropics. Um, I was, I was uh, out, uh, out birding here this morning, though, and uh, here in West Virginia, I can't, I can't stay inside. Like, it's a beautiful, beautiful spring day here. 
Um, and I saw black-throated blue warbler, black-throated green warblers, uh, yellow-throated vireos, um, which are all species, you know, in the, that have just, just arrived back from the tropics. It's pretty exciting. It's a great time to be a bird watcher.